that this is one of the things that people that are interested in abduction cases talk about quite often. And I don't think this is a mystery that's ever going to be solved. It could happen anywhere, anytime, to anybody. <laughs> there is an Area 51. There are many things that happen that uh, can't explain. Uh, something happened to those people, that couple. It might as well have been a UFO. Unidentified flying objects that have been reported below these many years. The first uh, evidence was uh, during uh, the time of Thomas Jefferson. People can be convicted of crimes on less evidence than what we have as evidence for UFOs. Given the size of the universe, there's got to be something out there besides us. There's no way we're alone out here. Not a chance. Where the lights were, you couldn't see what it was. This thing was like the size of a battleship or twice that big. This presents a real puzzle. I feel there's no question that it was a UFO. Not a believer or a disbeliever, just professionally skeptical about these things. And that's what's always struck me about the incident at Exeter, is that it's hard to punch holes in that story. I knew Betty and I knew Barney. I don't think that they just sat down and made this story up. It happened. It happened. The Exeter encounter and the Hill abduction are spectacular cases in their own right. But what is the bigger picture? What do these two events tell us about what is going on in the world at large? What's your thoughts on government cover-ups or covert societies attempting to control humanity? Do you believe in ancient astronauts, intergalactic communication, or extraterrestrial visitations? Ever had an experience with disembodied spirits or the paranormal universe? Are these subjects fact or fiction? Each week, Tony and Eddie explore these unbelievable realities and beyond. Exclusively on Truth Be Told. Hello and welcome back to another broadcast of Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm your host, Tony Sweet, and with me now is world-renowned psychic, Eddie Connor. Thanks, Tony, and welcome, everybody. Next up, Tony and I are covering an amazing story of two world-famous UFO experiences that took place in New Hampshire, one in September of 1961 and the other September of 65. And to help us understand these encounters are the directors of the documentary film Stranger Septembers. The first incident was the 19. 61 terrifying abduction of Betty and Barney Hill, and the other one, the 1965 UFO sightings seen by dozens of people. As quoted in the documentary bio, what can these two controversial UFO cases tell us about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going in terms of potential human interaction with intelligent extraterrestrials? And Tony, I think the best people to answer these questions are the directors of Stranger Septembers, Jeff and Jess Finn. Oh, the applause. And it's not canned, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for Thanks. having us. Well, I can say when I when I got the email about the documentary, I got really excited because honestly, I was telling Eddie, I've never heard about the incident. I, I've never heard, and he's heard about them. Yeah, Betty and Barney especially. I was very drawn to that back in the day because of the interracial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was dying to know what the behind the scenes stuff was because whatever we see on TV, we know there's 800,496.3 things of BS <laughs> right. usually happening behind the scenes interrogating whoever's in front of that camera usually, especially witnesses to something like this. And so, well, let's start, let's start uh, because, you know, as the directors, um, what got you into this project? I mean, what brought you to this project? I mean, in, in general... Um you want to pull up to the mic just a little bit. In general, it was the uh, the fact that we uh, there's our six year old knocking. It's <laughs> like are, are the aliens here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, in, in general, uh, it was our proximity to to the cases. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, we met in Los Angeles years ago, but we had moved to New England, where Jess is originally from. Oh, Boston. okay, cool. So we were living in the Boston area, and uh, in Arlington, Mass. And we realized we were within an hour of Exeter. 
And uh, the next thing I knew, I found myself just sort of, you know, taking jaunts up there uh, and checking out the field. You I know? think that came later. Actually, I think what happened first was the, the Exeter UFO Festival. And that was Oh, happening. they have a festival? They have a, yeah, it's a, it's a great festival they have up there every year in, I think, September. Strange September. Um, <laughs> Every Labor Day weekend they do it. Yeah, and uh, so we went We went there, and beforehand you contacted Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin and said, would you be interested in an interview? Uh, and that's, that's true, but you're my wife, so I can, I can cut you off. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. I'm used to it. I'm, on, I'm glad I'm on the other side of the table. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. No, but th- that is exactly true. We did do that. We contacted uh, uh, Stanton Freeman and Kathleen Martin at the uh, 2010 uh, festival, uh, Exeter UFO Festival, which was in you know, Labor Day, September. But prior to that, because I remember it was right after our daughter was born in February of 2010, that's mm-hmm. when I started putting the feelers out and sort of taking those jaunts up to Exeter. Uh, and Jess was very kind to stay home with our daughter in the diapers <laughs> during those jaunts. And uh, that's when I put the feelers out and just started to, you know, take some, you know, notes, armchair research, if you will. Yeah, you were super excited that we had, that was one of the reasons you wanted to move yes, to the Boston area. Because prior to that, I, you know, dialing back a bit, I had really studied uh, Stanton Friedman's cases and, and that He's kind great. of thing. Um, so, yeah, di- uh, jumping back there. Uh, I just sort of, you know, like I said, did some armchair research and, and sort of felt out the situation, got a feel for Exeter. And then you jump forward to what Jess was saying to the actual festival, maybe five months later. And that's when we met uh, Stanton Friedman, hmm. Kathleen Martin and Norman Muscarello's brother, Thomas. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I watched the documentary last night at home. And I, I, I honestly, the, like you said, because I didn't know the two incidents at least i don't remember but it was fascinating to me that it was so detailed of the accounts where you know because a lot of documentaries that is just kind of a vague you know they saw something and pretty they pretty much move on well and then a lot of it's just erased right from, and from their memory right and benny and barney hill it was erased from their memory at first which I've I found that fascinating, but that wasn't was it later that they said that, or was uh, no, what? It, it was a rate. They they had no memory of what happened. But how long did it take? Do you remember how long did it take for them to actually finally a while, recognize? Right? It was a while. Yeah, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember the specifics, but definitely Barney especially was having, as you said, some extreme. They're both uh, having nightmares. Reactions, right? you know, nightmarish uh, reactions, literally, and um, then of course um, they went under. Uh, professional hypnosis right. uh, with Dr. Benjamin Simon, uh, as is documented in you know the John Fuller book, uh, The Interrupted Journey. And um, the key thing about that is they, to my opinion, uh, they were um, hypnotized separately, mm-hmm. so as not to influence each other. They went into therapy other. with a hypnotherapist. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you sh- should you give a brief outline about what's what it is so that... Oh yeah, thanks for that. Yes. <laughs> Meaning the actual the actual look yeah. what happened exactly because <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, right. for, for those people who haven't seen the movie, who, uh, who do not, we're just know. talking about Betty and Barton. They're like, or yeah, yeah like who? Familiar <laughs> with yeah. The case. yeah, in the in the proverbial nutshell, um, it was September nineteenth, nineteen sixty one. Uh, Betty and Barney Hill were from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They were an interracial couple. Uh, I personally do not like to define them as such but um but it was the 60s it was, and it was given the context kind of, yeah. of the time yeah. it was it was the height unfortunately right. of uh, uh segregation yes in the u.s and uh that affected them uh, a great deal f- to my knowledge so um that gives you sort of the you know groundwork on them and uh barney was a civil rights uh enthusiast who worked tirelessly in his spare time for civil rights causes in new hampshire and new, new england and uh, Betty was a social worker. And they were both really well-respected people, you know, in their fields and in the community, that kind of thing. And they uh, took a Canadian vacation. They, they drove up to Canada for a vacation. And on the way back, returning, uh, they, as they claimed, uh, they were uh, abducted by what we would call you know, aliens or alien graves. Well, the first thing that happened is they heard a series of beeps, and then yeah. all of a sudden they were miles and miles away from where they heard the beeps, and they had no yeah. idea how they got there. Yeah. And then huh. they had the nightmares and uh, couldn't remember what had happened, and they went into hypnotherapy. And was this at night, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, and I should point out 
that I, doing that field research that I did, and then Jess and I did later together in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and, and then later in Exeter, which we'll get to, of course. Um, it It is black. Black is, is that new color of, that new shade of black that came out with <laughs> recently, Vanta Black. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. It was incredibly dark there at night, and not like it is here in L.A. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah no. it's no. never dark here. Yeah. And, yeah, it's out, and it's beautiful country. It's incredible, in, in my opinion, but um, but just incredibly pitch black at night. And, and as some of the locals told me, if you think it's black now, and this was circa 2010, uh, uh, you know, when I was first shooting the, the interviews, they said, imagine it nearly 50 years prior to that. Yeah, not so there many There were less lights, street yeah. lamps and less... And dirt roads, everything. not paved <laughs> roads. Yeah. Less civilization, yeah. you know, if you will. And I couldn't even fathom it. It just sent chills up my spine, you know, just considering what, what the situation may have been, whatever it was. But, um, yeah, you're right. The beeps... The beeps, they w- basically came to, although they were driving, so they weren't passed out. They just all of a sudden were miles away. No idea how. They went into hypnotherapy uh, and separately, and they um, started to remember what had happened to them. It's and, pieced and it the together. And yeah. rem- what they remembered is basically being ad- abducted by aliens. And so w- at that time when they started remembering, w- how long did it take before it started spreading around. Years. That's the amazing thing. Um, really ironic in a sense that uh, they did not want the information out there. They were. Oh, they know, didn't at all. They did not want it out at all. They were very, ex- especially Barney. He was extremely uncomfortable with, with the reality of the situation, the attention. Because they were already an interracial couple in the 60s, mm-hmm. and the last thing they wanted is attention to be paid right. to them. That's right. what, that's what, uh, that's what uh, <laughs> Betty's niece, Kathleen Martin, uh, the ufologist and writer, she told us, you know, she said, you have to understand, you know, the last thing on earth they wanted, uh, so to speak, was, uh, <laughs> you know, because they, they were coming off the tail end of the 50s and the tinfoil hat crown mm-hmm. and you know, everything was very schlock theater and that kind of <laughs> thing. And that had all sort of died down uh, from, from my understanding. And uh, and then of course in 1961 this this incident occurred, and um, you know Kathleen made it very clear that the last thing her aunt wanted or or Barney was uh, the media you know and the spotlight on them, and so it was uh, nearly uh, four years later uh, when the story was leaked by a, a reporter named John Luttrell, who just passed away about four or five years ago four or five I believe, um, for a newspaper called the Boston Traveler, hmm. and. Yeah, they he, had confided in friends. Yes. But that's basically Was that at it. their church, right? Through their yeah, church. Their yeah, church. Yeah, their church. And, you know, just their friends in general. But they hadn't. They didn't tell anybody about it other than that. Okay. And I'm surprised the church, uh, how, you know, because church and sometimes religion and UFOs, they get kind of... And I'm surprised they actually yeah. took that in. And, Me too, actually. In a positive... What, yeah. Do you remember what uh, kind of church or what... Religion? You know, offhand, I I, I'm trying to recall yeah. if it was a Unitarian church. Oh, well, me. That at that sense. time, it's still. <laughs> uh, but even then, yeah. 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 Unitarians yeah. are generally yeah. a little, little more, more open. open. About yeah. yeah, so so the, it was somebody from the church they had told leaked Not it out? Not someone, but uh, no. But there's a couple of uh, people are in the church. They oh. kind of t- kind of told, told a bunch of people, that, of, of their friends, basically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And somebody leaked it to a reporter. One one I remember one source told me, uh, uh, you know, that it was uh, leaked, if you will, at a cocktail party, <laughs> uh, everybody's uh, getting uh, drunk, mm-hmm. featuring people who start. had been at the <laughs> church, and you know others, and and Latrell was there, and that's how he got it. But I'm I'm not sure. I'm trying to recall if that's in Stanton's and Kathleen's book or not. Uh, forgive me, but at any rate, it was leaked, and then you jump to you know now we're in 1965, mm-hmm. and John Fuller, the writer, uh, was doing uh, his field research for the Exeter case, what he called the incident at Exeter. And do you, you want to outline that? What Jess and I call the Exeter encounter. Um, and, uh, yes. Um, and, you know, Fuller was, was in town in Exeter, New Hampshire, to, to do uh, his pre, uh, you know, preliminary writing for what became the incident at Exeter, a book. And he sort of stumbled upon a gold mine in the Hill case. <laughs> And they were sort of linked to a degree. And uh, the next thing you know, he wrote two books on each case, The Interrupted Journey about Betty and Barney Hill's case, and then again, uh, Incident at Hold those up there. Yeah. About the, uh, the two police officers, Eugene Bertrand 
and David Hunt and an 18-year-old uh, high school graduate who was about to go into the Navy uh, named Norman Muscarello. And they had a UFO sighting. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I'm gonna I, I I'm gonna play this. I don't know what the this is a clip I believe of uh, Stanton. I just want to see what he has to <clears throat> say. The guys in Roswell weren't picking up people, as far as we know. Look where they were. This is southwestern. I mean, this is in the southwest, not far from uh, the military bases there, not far from the first atom bomb test, not far from White Sands where the rockets were being fired. And Roswell was the home of the only atomic bombing group in the world. And none of that has, we haven't heard of anything indicating they landed, grabbed people, and examined them and tossed them back. So it's an entirely different set of behavior. I mean, they may have been the pioneers, the Roswell guys, checking out what the hell are these idiot earthlings doing. <laughs> Which is, I, I love him. I think he's a, he's a great author and just uh, knowledgeable. But uh, I, I, I was, in, in the documentary, I saw that um, uh, Betty had more of a positive uh, encounter than Barney. Could you explain that for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, again, based on you know what I've absorbed, uh, uh, as as James Earl Jones also notes in the film, uh, in our documentary, he says, uh, you know, Betty for Betty was sort of a lark. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she thought it was just you know uh, a wonderful, surreal, uh, once in a lifetime experience, and uh, Barney unfortunately went quite the other way. And uh, it really affected him uh, in terms of his, you know, just mental outlook and, and, and physically as well. Hmm. Um, so it's unfortunate, but that's... Uh, yeah, she felt that the, the aliens didn't mean them any harm, that they were curious about us and wanted to learn more about us. And Barney had more medical issues after the fact, too. So I Didn't mean, he have, like, uh, like warts around his He had a ring of warts gen- around his groin. Uh, yeah. where they, and they had put a cup over it uh, to extra- extract a sample. Hmm. And, uh, and then he had a ring of warts around there. I don't know. I mean, in my opinion, horrible things happened to Betty, too. So, I, I mean, they did a you know, whole exam in there. And mm. For both of them. Uh, well, he was him, so it's for a, sure. It's really interesting. I, I mean, I think the whole alien probing thing, you know, have the alien probe joke, basically, right. yeah. that's like based on the Hill case. Yeah, that's right. where it started, and and, and the it same ended with in the South whole, Park. And then in South Park, I don't know. It probably didn't end there. With the Tom Cruise joke. It oh, peaked, it peaked in South Park. <laughs> but uh, and and the other interesting thing to me is that the whole uh, image that we have of an alien with the big eyes mm-hmm. and. And the slit of the mouth that that also comes from the the Hill case. That's, oh really? Yeah, that's the first um, Betty. You know, she described what she saw, and that and that's that's where we get that whole image from. Is from this case. In a completely unrelated thing, I was born in '61, and when we moved, of course, it's a trailer park. It wasn't Harvard or Princeton or Yale. It was a <laughs> trailer park in North Carolina. Um, But I would see a being just like that long before I ever heard about them in mainstream media in any way, shape, or form. Now, I never told anybody that until I was an adult, but I have three brothers, and one of the two, one of, there's four of us total, two out of four of us saw the same thing repeatedly in the same part of the house repeatedly our entire childhood. And it would just lean out from the side of the door. It started with its fingers. It was about this tall. And then it would lean in like this. And But it never, to my knowledge, stepped across the doorway. And it did the same thing mm-hmm. to one of my other brothers. And we started talking about that in my 50s. Wow. So it's interesting. You're not the first person to tell me that, yeah. by the way. Like similar things or people like through my childhood, I was visited. Yeah. <laughs> And it was, and it was the, it was the identical thing. Wow. I had that. It was just my awkward brother, though. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> we got it here at the beginning of the show it's, with our yeah. daughter. Yeah. 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 My <laughs> awkward brother here for a probe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, like I said, this, 
this incident actually went on to uh, a book and a movie, and uh, I know uh, James Earl Jones and Estelle, well, I forgot her last name. Parsons. Parsons, Parsons yeah. which I was watching, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's Roseanne Barr's mother on <laughs> Roseanne. I was just like, ah, I love that. Uh, but th- I want to play a little clip that says James Earl Jones takes an uneventful drive. So let's just talk uh, talk about this after we, well, we went listen to, to him. I, I got in the car. I tried to convince somebody to go with me. Got a camera, put it on the dashboard, and got note, note, notepads and paper and pencils. And I drove up in the time of September. That I, it, it, you know, I, was, I, I wasn't brave, but I said, let's have a look. You know, is there anything about that season that evokes this? You know, is there anything about Halloween? Anything, anything that evokes this stuff? Yeah. And I, and I took the drive, dullest drive I've ever had in my life <laughs> in the White Mountains. You know that that's that's a good point. Is both were in September, mm-hmm. uh, so in how far apart are are the in, uh, incidences? Uh, the physical distance, yeah. Um, yeah, essentially within an hour, give or take, right? Wow. The, the white well, the white mountains. The white mountains are maybe. Th- I'm thinking from Boston, they're around three but two and a half Exeter? to three hours, but yeah. from Exeter. Trying to recall, maybe uh, an hour and a half. Right? I should know this. <laughs> it's well, like no, there, that's okay. But, uh, that's okay. And, but is there other sightings? Is it known for UFO yes. activity? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's something that was just a whole other parallel. Well, people can call of worms, the unofficial you know? Roswell. Like, oh really? Yeah, they do Exeter, that. Yeah. Yeah, the East that's Coast. That's why Roswell, they have the yeah. um, UFO festival there. And I do want to mention these clips are all not in the movie, so these are all. Oh just nice! Oh, great. These are like exclusive, exclusive. clips. Yeah, and, I, I was going to say I don't remember yeah. that. And clip, how so. how rural are the areas where these things happen in 61 and 65, right? Yeah, the uh, again, the White Mountains, uh, you know, I know. That's, it, yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's sort of like a, like a hybrid. I mean, there are patches that are just dense with, uh, you know, woods and forest. And, and, um, uh, and then, of course, in the midst of all that, uh, you know, you've got the, what used to be called the Old Man of the Mountain. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, he's sort of a, a structure in the mountainside. Not that anymore. Re- I, I crumbled oh. and fell uh, a number of years ago. Oh, it did. Oh, yeah. I thought they were mining for coal. But oh, no, they didn't a, do it on purpose. It <laughs> fell. Uh, oh, okay. That was a huge down. tourist attraction, as I understand it. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's, you know, skiing up there. And so on the one hand, it's very civilized. You've got the, you know, tourist attractions, motels, hotels, mm-hmm. ski chalet, that kind of thing. And then again, just dense. But where they were was, yeah. although well, the Exeter, were, there was a house there, so, but there were houses. I it, should say that, too, regarding... Uh, the Exeter case, uh, is that okay if I jump to that? Yeah, yeah. Basically, this is uh, fascinating. Because, uh, again, they're just so sort of interlinked uh, to various degrees. Um, um, when Norman Muscarello, the 18-year-old, uh, was he was hitchhiking home. Uh, oh, and, you know, these New England states, the joke is that each one's the size of a postage stamp. So you could literally walk uh, X amount of miles and be, you know, in one of the other states. And he was hitchhiking home in the, in the dead of night from his girlfriend's home uh, in Amesbury, uh, Massachusetts, so technically another state, crossing the state line wow. into uh, where he lived in Exeter, New Hampshire. And um, I've stood, I followed his path. I walked it at night. I wanted to, you know, get the feel. And again, this was, you know, 2010, Norman, 1965. <laughs> it was as black as the White Mountains where the hills had their experience. I mean, Whoa. it was just pitch black. And... Uh, Absolutely eerie, and so I can only imagine how you know what it was like then for him. Jeff took his own uneventful rides during the making of this movie. <laughs> oh, he really? Would go out at night. Yeah, we would go to the White Mountains, and uh, he would go out at night, like search, you know, just to see what would happen and come back. I'm like, she used I to say, like, "You, you want to get captured? I think you want to get abducted. <laughs> you get He's like, I, I just remember, think I it might be saying, cool. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little <laughs> I'm doing bit. it for you, apparently. <laughs> I, I just want to meet him and say hi. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's all they're going to do. <laughs> just yeah, a little that's ringworm. Maybe that's they're uh, benevolent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Betty, what's going on? Uh, but yeah, I, I would. And each time I would leave, you know, the hotel we had rented or whatever, she would say, please just come back. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or come back, uh, you. Yeah, yeah yes. really. Yes. Don't come back as Cartman. <laughs> right, Although right. if you had gone, I imagine you would have been like Betty. You would have been like, this is great. <laughs> Well, uh, I know, I know uh, Tom, Norman's uh, brother, uh, didn't he say that Norman was not a fearful guy? No. Like, he no. was very, like, strong. He's the kid and, going to the Navy, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he referred he, to tough. Norman as, no. quote, the word was tough. Yeah. His yeah. brother was tough, nothing and the And the police officers, too. They yeah. weren't, you know. Oh, yeah. They were all 
when you when you see the interview with, with Norman, uh, the the footage, uh, vintage footage of Norman that we had uh, secured uh, from a local uh, television channel in New Hampshire, it, you know, it, again, it's just sort of takes your breath away a little. He's even all those years later. I mean, this is in the '90s. This interview mm -hmm. was was uh, taped. You could just see uh, uh, the dread. You know, there's just a sense of dread in him. And then he goes on to describe uh, Eugene Bertrand and David Hunt, uh, the the Exeter police officers that you know also also witnessed so. the same craft or or object or or what have you. And he described how they had a sense of fear. He used the term sense of fear. And again, these are cops, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> old school cops in in uh, New England, you know. So you, you're not going to imagine these guys are quaking in their boots over just anything. You know? <laughs> so very well, interesting. Before we take a break, because we're going to take a break in about three minutes, uh, I want to go back to um, uh, Betty and Barney. Uh, Barney actually didn't he end up passing away at the end of the 60s is it brain cancer or something or br something brain related yes uh yeah i know he was 46 years old as, as i understand and uh just you know really tragic uh, again those last few years uh just sort of a tailspin you know a downward spiral uh, uh culminating in his passing away and uh and then betty conversely lived to a ripe old age and yeah. was known as the godmother of ufology so which wow. is great and did was it was it Barney that actually had something removed from his brain that was like? No, yeah, it was there, Bertrand. There, oh, Bertrand. Okay, okay. Yes, there. Oh, you know, with, Sir Bertrand. At yeah. the risk of sounding dramatic here, I mean, I don't really know how else to to term it, but I had my own, uh, you know, what I called, uh, for lack of a better term, a deep mouth, uh, deep throat, deep something. Uh, we saw that and we're like, what are we? In Dave, is that a, <laughs> what are we watching? Here? I, I was, <laughs> uh, I was uh, approached by someone at the very end, very end of uh, uh, filming the documentary, uh, post production actually, and uh, they informed me that um, uh, two things: one, that Norman uh, Muscarello had experienced missing time, hmm. was the exact quote um, uh, after his experience, and that Eugene Bertrand, the the first police officer on the scene to have witnessed the same craft after Norman, uh, that he allegedly uh, had an, a quote, an object removed from his brain. Now, Bertrand did, in fact, die of uh, brain cancer, uh, you know, uh, in the 90s, in the late 90s. Um, and, you know, we made it very clear we can not really endorse this or, you know, it, it can't <coughs> confirm it, but I will say the source was very reputable. Hmm. And that much I can definitely put on the record. I mean, they were a reputable source, otherwise I would have never you know, right. gone with it. And that alone was uh, intense. That's a whole other can of worms where I had a member of Eugene's family uh, contact me, and at first they were very upset, and then later retracted and said they, they greatly appreciated that we had made the film and put that information out there for posterity, you know. Meanwhile, how the hell does it affect your whole being for the rest of your life and everyone you love when something that big outside of your box of thinking and being happens and then you come back from that? It's like I used or to say. Or do you come back from I don't, it? I don't think anybody came back from it. I don't think it, so. I think looking, that you, well, watching it, uh, Betty's the only one that seemed to be the most... Yeah. Like, exactly. Angels. She should have embraced it, but yeah. I don't know. I wonder. I wonder if it affected her negatively. Right, and even some of the people around them too. Yeah. I mean, well, let's take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, I want to get into more of the Exeter uh, encounter because uh, I find I found that fascinating because it was over a house. There was a passing car and some other little unknown factors and to we want to know what kind of pandora's box you two been opening up doing stuff like this yeah <laughs> which yeah all right so we're going to come back with uh jeff and jess finn uh, they are the directors of the documentary film called strange uh Step septembers and you can go to strange septembers.com and uh this is truth be told with tony and eddie i'm tony sweet i'm eddie connor and we're going to be right back with more show don't go anywhere be right back do you suffer from anxiety, from depression, maybe even chronic pain? Well, listen up. Truth Be Told is going to tell you about a breakthrough program built on over 100 years of therapies used in America's returning veterans to help you successfully overcome PTSD, anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. The secret proven in study after study. 
Music therapy. The effects of music are nothing short of amazing. From strokes to PTSD, music has been shown to improve the quality of life. Now, one of the latest music therapy programs being used in America's veteran hospitals can be yours to experience for free at home and to help your own anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. Or just relax after a hard day. It's called Whole Tones. It takes music therapy to a new level. This revolutionary program makes use of specifically designed frequencies that have been shown to stimulate your body's natural healing power down to a cellular level. If it works for battle scarred vets, can it work for you? Well, experience it for yourself for free at sweetholtones.com. Like Tony Sweet, that's S W E E T. Go to sweetholtones.com. Now enjoy the show. Do you suck? It was an interesting marriage. I wasn't really quite sure what interracial marriage was about at that time up there. Uh, but I really thought, being from up there, that it was a bold move on her part to marry a black man. Uh, because uh, it's, it's, it was in, in the old days when I was a kid, a very restrictive society. In the first place, there weren't very many black people. And, uh, or any Jews or anything in the town where I lived, none. So uh, I thought it was very curious that, that she had uh, married a black man, and I wasn't quite sure how the um, societal pressure and component, what that had to do with, with uh, the whole thing, the whole abduction and everything what sort of leaps in faith or hope or whatever she took about him and also about the uh, UFO incident. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Eddie Connor, And I'm Tony Sweet. We have Jeff and Jess Finn here. They're the directors of Stranger September. Strange. Strange. Oh, good Lord! Then, then <laughs> Stranger September will be the uh, that'll be the sequel. <laughs> Thank you so That's much. That's right. Stranger More September's strange September <laughs> in three D <laughs> with Tom Cruise and Scientology. Sorry, I did that earlier too. <laughs> I caught myself. That's so. okay. And then we'll come out with Strangest the Reckoning. <laughs> <Strangest. That's right. laughs> yeah. The Grays are back. Right. Sequel fifteen. That is hysterical. <laughs> now, what kind of can of worms has this opened up in your lives, or has it? Yes. Well, <laughs> good or bad. Just going out on all those uh, that field research in the very be beginning when our daughter was in diapers that was uh, that was interesting yeah right? yeah I mean I think <laughs> one of the coolest things for me um, making this movie and telling people oh, I'm making this movie or I made this movie was hearing everybody's abduction and sighting mm -hmm. stories That's or, or sighting stories that no one I know has been abducted actually but but yeah like you I mean that yeah. that uh, I've heard a lot. And everybody's seen something. Oh, yeah. Everyone has seen a UFO. Yeah, I've seen like, one when I was a kid. I never saw an alien, but I saw. Not, I mean, so many people. She's seen one herself. She's oh, on the fence. Really? He says but. I have. <laughs> you can, you could, it was unidentified. But I'm you have like, to remember that's the that's what it is. It as Stanton always flare. says, and a UFO is is not a flying saucer. People equate that. I'm with saying that, though, a lot it's of people. It's an unidentified flying object. Have full on. Like m someone I know who is very, you know, would sh she's like, I've never told anyone this because I don't want people to think I'm crazy. But <laughs> exactly. giant over her car, silent and just like a few feet over her car and then gone. And I'm you know, yeah. there, there's a new hypothesis out about all of this with the abductions and the sightings of the UFOs that if you are that close to one or an extraterrestrial that you are absolutely on some level probably have already been abducted whether you know it or not subconsciously yeah. what do you think about that i know people who thought who thought they were abducted i, don't I, know. I can you know but i'll be honest with you uh i can't really think of a better forum for it and I'll, I'll make it brief but i uh not this past christmas eve the one before uh 2014 um about six weeks prior to that i had a a great pain in my in my foot the ball of my foot and I could barely walk, so I finally went to a dermatologist, and, and they pulled out a small uh, sliver, uh, but not a sliver, just a very strange little thing. The guy said he'd never seen anything like it. And I realized that right <laughs> after I had it removed, <laughs> the recurring ab abduction dream I'd had since I was maybe, you know, Left, six gone. or so. Seven or so. Yeah, yep, that's nope, about when I don't starts. have them anymore. And I don't think I'm 
worthy of study or anything like that. It's not like I think I'm any special case, but I can't deny that fact. I, I don't have those dreams anymore, at least consciously. Well, and yeah. that's that's another one of the patterns. And then they also often, it often happens in more isolated areas, like in Alaska. Well, There's you grew been, up in the Midwest, so. Oh. You hear that it happens everywhere. And it, oh, you know, yeah. To, to my, for my two cents, I mean, it makes absolute sense, uh, so to speak, that, you know, if we are the only intelligent beings in this universe, that's, that's so pretty scary. scary. I was going to say, no, you know, I, I, I think the universe can do far better than humans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I with, all due, with all due respect, so. yeah. if we're the, if we're the last hope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, with the war, with the wars, the continual wars, we and, need and to turn to the strife. dolphins and whales. Then, you know, I don't want to go off on the soapbox, but I, I definitely, I've always been open minded to that. Uh, of course, I can't prove uh, anything, but um, I've always been open minded to it. And after making this film, I guarantee you. My mind was blown wide open. You I want, know? Yeah, and I want to go back to something you were just saying. Once you do something like this, <clears throat> people do come out of the woodwork because they finally have someone they feel they can confide in. And obviously, if you're taking the time out of your lives to do a documentary like this, they feel safe for starters. But they're also, even if they never tell another soul on planet Earth, they're, it, they can get it out, they can get that burden off of them. It's not that they're putting it onto you as much as it is they feel seen and heard. Yeah. And like they are, it's not an isolated incident with just them. Yeah. You guys must have that happen all the time. Oh, well, I mean, we've interviewed so many people or just, from I mean, USO. Regular people. Oh, my God. Yeah. Being like, oh, this is oh, what yeah. you do. You're at Ralph's yeah. in the checkout line. I, this is what happened. <laughs> well, to me growing, when I was growing 10. up, I've all, I mean, growing up from uh, time I can remember, people just came up to me and started just telling me their sorrows and their stories. I mean, I didn't have to ask. People just would just talk to me, and I'm just like, do I have like a sign on me that says <laughs> just do. unload? Yeah. And, but, you know, I, but you find out a lot of it. Uh, very interesting information about people. I mean, some good, some bad, but uh, this, I mean, this, the people, a lot of people coming out of the word works, but there are some people that have mental illness. Well, that'll, that, that'll I be mean, that's any, Sure. There's always that. Yeah. Sure. And you can differentiate usually pretty quickly. Now, I'm going to go back to uh, the Exeter encounter. Uh, Norman and the, the, is it Eugene and David? Yes. Uh, so, did any of them say that they end up, uh, were they ever suicidal, you know, de severe depression after the incident? I mean, do you, did you? I spoke with, uh, I, I had the good fortune to to meet uh, David Hunt's wife mm -hmm. um, near the very end. And uh, I'll try to keep that brief. But I, it was, it was surreal for me. I had been trying to meet with David. Eugene had already passed uh, prior to filming. And I'd been trying to get in touch with David Hunt uh, for, you know, a year. And I finally drove, I just drove to his house. Knock on the door. And Tom Muscarello told me, I'll never forget, he said, he's, he's going to shoot you. Yeah, <laughs> really? And I said, please tell me you're kidding, right? And he said, I, I don't know. Okay, he doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah. And, and he so basically never talked about it. Again. I took a chance and I met with his, his wife, Janice, and she was lovely. And I will never forget it till the day I die. It was like in a movie, uh, David's, it was night. And the, the reflection of the TV was lighting up the, the living room wall. And I saw David's shadow move across the room. And I heard him say, you know, tell him I'm sorry. I, I just can't do it. Wow. And then, you know, I'm standing out there in the rain at his door. <laughs> it's like the graduate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and she was so kind to me. She said, I, I just hope you understand that he does appreciate what you're doing. But this has been hell for him. It's been that's horrible sad. for him, it, you know. So they, their their reputations were, of were course. I think it was worse for beyond him tarnished for some reason than yeah. the others. Yes, even but well, it was yeah. horrible for Norman. He, he was yeah, it more but, the reputation than actual encounter? I think it was more the reputation. Yeah. Than the so in, and they all stayed back in the same town. Yeah. Yes. Oh my oh, yeah. god. They lived there. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, they all the grown end. up there. They all. I mean. Yeah, they stayed. I mean, Norman, it's, you know, to, there, it's, it's Navy, in the... Right. right. Other, I mean, Norman went to the Navy, but he, he came back. It's in the but, film, you know. He The first time he actually saw John Fuller's book, uh, Incident at Exeter, was when he was stationed in Vietnam. But didn't I, he sign the rights away? He did. Like, he was just like, eh, well, here. Yeah. Well, I yeah. guess they made <laughs> him. That's my understanding. I, yeah. I think the, na the Navy made him. They said, you need to get rid of these reporters. You need out. to get rid of these people. 
they're you know they're causing trouble and bothering us and so he's like eh, just go away yeah and signed it and one thing i loved that you had was someone a representative from the air force i mean uh mm-hmm. he was retired at the time that uh so I mean, but in a positive way like he you mm-hmm. know most of them are like oh it was a weather balloon oh but this guy was actually supportive yeah, Lieutenant Brandt. Yes, yeah. Alan yes. Brandt. Yeah, he was uh, an amazing find, and uh, I wish I could have found his uh, superior, uh, Major David Griffin, but uh, it was my understanding that he had passed. Mm. Um, but, you know, uh, as I told Jess, uh, I was just telling her earlier, you know, my hope is that our film uh, will help others, you know, take it to the next level and yeah. mm-hmm. dig, dig deeper, you know, perhaps with a real, <laughs> you know, Hollywood budget and that kind of thing, because uh, this was as we joke a lot, a uh, sort of a punk rock documentary. You know? But I think a Hollywood budget would have would make things. Yeah, you know, I mean, just for, for, for their budget. disposal. Yes, I think yeah. it, this this is the kind of grassroots thing that I personally think when you see these people and then you meet the two of you and you put that world together and it's the alchemic process of it emotionally, psychically, spiritually, instinctually, creatively, artistically, that's the kind of thing that gets Hollywood's attention because sincerity speaks way louder than action and words. Mm -hmm. And you guys have it in spades. And obviously I haven't seen it, but I can just tell from you talking about it and what (laughs) you're sharing that it's what I will set my ass down and eat a bowl of ice cream. And I will be watching (laughs) Betty and Barney. (laughs) and trying to you know you know what i mean there's something about it that opens minds and hearts in a way that the big budget right now might not have done but it's setting the stage to springboard into that i will tell you you're right on target because it was a you know we may not have had the big slick hollywood budget um and again to be fair we started out it was going to be a youtube documentary wow. oh, really? and yeah. it just morphed and grew and expanded yeah, I, I think inter- last night i jokingly said two flip cams in a dream yeah <laughs> yeah we, yeah we, we shot it on flip, flip cams. cams i mean we had no intention i of, actually you know. i saw i think i saw the the flip cam uh, yeah when you were yeah you standing. did so yeah. we're, we're not we're not making yeah. excuses i mean it was a yeah. labor of love i mean we we were in the field we went out there we felt these people everyone was wonderful i mean from kathleen and stanton to yeah, Jeff everyone. wanted to move to Exeter. We briefly considered it. I actually it. considered it. I mean, you would walk up to people, yeah. like people's houses, and knock. Are you for and, sale? They'd, <laughs> and they'd say, or no, just to ask them oh, if okay. they had knew. Because yeah. he would ask people on the street, everything, just like, what do you think about the Exeter I- incident? What do, you, what do you think about it? But he would go into people's houses and they'd say, come on in, I'll, I'll make some lemonade. Oh, there, there was one was lady, like, I'm this guy. There was one like, lady who you? said, you know, you, oh, you want to talk about the flying stuff? Come on, I'll make you some lemonade. Yeah. She that in her living room. That's what yeah. I, that's that's like why I from. love growing up the way that I yeah, grew up. that's where I grew up in that Kansas. Was wonderful. So, yeah, small oh, towns. Yeah. What other kind of paranormal things have you guys dealt with in your own life that's not on the <laughs> she flip looks cam. At me. I don't have anything. Nothing. <laughs> really? Nothing she's like so never intuitive. I, I'm so into this stuff. I know. <laughs> I love ghosts. I love all yeah, of it. Yeah, you're very empathic and intuitive oh, and instinctual well, and psychic, psychic and all of that so. stuff. You can t- no, yeah, you're already there. And you too. No, nothing ever happens I've had the term me. empath emblazoned on my back since uh, I was a little kid. Oh, definitely. Kid. Yeah. By just going and greeting people, so I, how people are you, uh, Like you were talking, where people it's come up to you and they pour it out to you. just trust him to That's an not put them in their home. But again, your energy <laughs> arrives before the voice, before the body, before yeah. all of that stuff. And people have to feel safe. And you guys do that. Mm-hmm. I, I can tell you, I mean, again, um, Jeff's had more experiences to answer your question, than I have. I've had a number of them. You know, and, and it, it, it's funny because uh, I'll be 50 next year. And, you know, you turn around one day and you're like, I'm going to be 50 next year. <laughs> you know? and, and you realize you have had a number of these experiences. I never mm-hmm. really considered myself, you know, one of those people. With all due respect to those people, I, you know, it just all of a sudden there was a tally. Yeah. And I was like, my, my gosh, you know, I, my, my sister and I uh, saw a UFO uh, within the year after uh, I saw the UFO incident on TV in 1975 when it aired. James Earl Jones, Estelle Parsons, which is why we interviewed them for this film. And, you know, the film blew my mind. I was eight years old. You know, it was incredible, scary. Um, and, and then my sister and I saw this binocular-shaped craft, pure white, uh, mm-hmm. like opaque, uh, X amount of months after that. And then the years went on, nothing. But then, uh, you know, you that do you the remember. tally, and I realized yeah, that I, I was having that recurring dream all yeah. those years yeah. where I'm running, and a craft is above me. I don't see it, but I can sense it. You, yeah. And then I'm running like in, in the ET or whatever, where the kid's going up in the air. Yeah. And that then the dream ends. 
so take me back to the first time, like the first time I saw the book cover communion, I almost fainted in the bookstore. That's the truth because that's the first time I'd come face to face with it. And then I read it. I freaked my freak and then fire <laughs> in the sky. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I was just like, Travis it, yeah, Warren. it blew me away because I was like, I don't want to know any of that part, <laughs> but in your dream, that's whenever you're out of your body and that's when the subconscious is talking to you and directly to your soul. So obviously it kept coming back to revisit you with the running from the craft and that sort of thing. So it's you, the subconscious is driving you too to do this. I did Again, used to I, have... I, I, I was just going to say, for the record, I can't prove anything, you know, one way no, or the other, but, can. but right. uh, it's, exactly. it's definitely substantial. I mean, yeah. it's something that, that's uh, impacted me. And... Uh, Mostly in a positive sense. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I was going to say, I, I used to have a re recurring dream, like night terrors, actually, <laughs> where I'd wake up screaming, where I was, my feet were on the ground, and there was an alien craft holding my hands, and I was being stretched, but... But well, there you go. Like, but that sounds very like that could be. But just how old and were you? Scene. I was yeah, right. eight. Drop some. Okay. Or so, and then, did, did you see eight. a movie where they were holding people down on an exam table and going to probe them? Or did it I, just... I hope not. No, exactly. Eight. It just starts bubbling up. Yeah. Well, my. I mean, I would have recurring nightmares after I saw the movie Poltergeist. Like, that movie scared me so hard that I, for years, screaming, <laughs> waking up screaming in the middle of the night and stuff. And But one of those screaming things, it was that UFO but so, thing. So, but let's look at that for one second. Not that I'm a psychic psychologist over here. I'm just like, you know, I like Ben and Jerry's ice cream and... 50% off Easter candy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but look at that. She's a little girl. She effing disappears. Oh, yeah. No, that's good. And then they can't find her, and she Older doesn't guys. know how to get back. Yeah. And then she comes back. Yeah. Hello, well, it triggered something. Well, it's also a terrifying movie for a little kid to see. So yeah, let's I, talk I mean, about your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'd love that. By, by, Polter, <laughs> by Poltergeist three, I was I was scared too because it was not that good. Yeah. <laughs> no, once Polter, well, I, I don't like sequels like that because then they yeah. have to explain why the ghosts are there and uh, everything. Yeah. It ruins everything. Yeah. It's like well, it should just the terrifying thing to me about ghosts and movies mm -hmm. like that, Paranormal Activity. Is uh is you don't know why they're there right. and it's you can't that's the see scary them. part. It, well, you see them, but then you know, then it's kind of like, <gasps> you know, who was supposed to play the mother in that movie uh, Poltergeist? Mm -hmm. Shirley MacLaine. Oh, oh my really? god, that would have been perfect. Oh, she said, "I do not want to do any movie that negatively depicts." Oh, the paranormal. I will only do movies that positively depict it because wow. that's been my experience. Wow. And then she went what right on to do Terms of Endearment and do what win an Academy Award. Well, talk so about what's... messing me little me up. Yeah, in Terms of Endearment. Oh, oh I know, <laughs> boy. I just let's not even talk about it. I liked yeah. it when Start she crying. beat the shit out of her grandchild. Did because she hit oh him? Yeah, that. she hit him. I just remember She's the like, Don't somebody you... get pain meds for my child. I, I don't, that yeah. Part. Well, then she beat the crap out of the grandkid. Oh, did she? <laughs> I'm not laughing at that. I'm, I'm like how he has a big old smile on his face. Like I know. It's well, like, that was awesome. He was a bratty ass little kid. <laughs> and guess what? It was the 70s. That's when yeah, we got to hit people. Yeah. Yeah. Trump. All right. We only have a few more minutes left. On the next Truth Be Told. I know. But I want to I want to end with this because we really didn't talk about the 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 actual incident of Exeter, uh, where the two police officers, the young 18-year-old, um, what's his name, Norman, uh, were in a, was it, I guess it was a field? I yeah, Norman Norman was hitchhiking along the, right. the it he wasn't was a highway, road. it was a road. And they Next were, in the, the UFO, or the, that they saw was just over the trees. Came right. up over the field. Yeah. Right. Pretty over the trees. close, uh -huh. and uh, not any kind of a craft and that any of them had seen or experienced. But and, I'll, and, and Bertrand had Air Force experience, so he was oh, familiar that's right, with... That's right. That's, that's very key. And no sound. No, no sound. sound. Oh, they never um, make They sound. never make a sound. Yeah. Like, you know, blinding red light. Um, uh, and then I they said that Bertrand was afraid of radiation. He actually oh, grabbed yes, Muscarello going to and ask. dragged him back to the police because car. Because they didn't want to get too close yeah. to it. But I, I wanted to show this picture that when... Uh, what was the one... Who's the one that pulled the gun? Bertrand. Uh, Bertrand, yeah. Which I loved. I, it made me <laughs> laugh out loud when he's like, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to challenge the, this uh, uh, 
uh, craft. Is this George Dufour? Yeah, he pulls yeah. out. A, George Dufour is telling the story of Bertrand pulling his gun and pointing it at the craft. And then he's like, "What am I doing?" Yeah, he's like, "Yeah, I shoot." And they're going to be gonna like, "Shoot this thing." Yeah. yeah. Uh, and one one thing that you had is a great narrator of uh, a narrator of your film was Peter Weller. Yeah, Robocop. Yeah, Robocop how'd you get that? I mean, that's that's a pretty good gift. We had a whole list of people that we wanted, and uh, I'm surprised James Earl Jones didn't do it with his voice. Well, I think we originally <laughs> asked him, and he yeah. said no, and then we're like, "Do you want to get interviewed?" Because you, you could, and he and he said, "Yeah." So oh. that was cool. Yeah, yeah. And um, so yeah, we at, we we had a whole list of people, and one of them was Peter Weller because he's awesome mm-hmm. and has an amazing voice and all that. And our producers were like, "We know him." Yeah. Oh wow. The you flu. know Peter Weller? And they're like, yeah, we know him. We can just ask him. So that. And I was a huge uh, uh, William Burroughs fan. So oh, yeah. when he started yeah. Naked Lunch, I was like, oh, there, there, you, <laughs> there you go. But that's all part of the solchronicity of the mission statement behind why you do what you do. It yeah. just fell into place. Yeah. And uh, all right, so the time is almost up. So where do people see it? How can we find out more information about it? What's next? And what's yeah? What is next? <laughs> because you know, there's a lot more. As you kindly pointed out earlier, they can go to Strange Septembers. Uh, that's Septembers plural. Strange Septembers, all one word. Dot com. com, and that'll give you everything. That'll take you to the Vimeo link for the video on demand, where you can buy or rent the film as of today. And uh, no April Fool's joke. Yeah, yeah. It's available <laughs> now. At, I think it's Vimeo dot com slash Strange Septembers. Yes. So and as, as far as what's it. next, we are um, three and a half years into production on a documentary called Before the End, Searching for Jim Morrison, uh, where we try to locate uh, the human Jim Morrison as opposed to the Lizard King or the sex, drugs, rock and roll brand, uh, which has sort of been shoved down everyone's throats for 50 years. Right. And uh, we just try to get to who he really was and why, starting from birth uh, till the uh, would-be end in Paris. It's fascinating. I've watched many documentaries, you know, Amy Winehouse, Mama Cass, uh, Janis Joplin. I mean, the the visual of what we see on stage is completely different than oh, what yeah. is behind the scenes. I well, mean, also what we know of Jim, most people know of Jim Morrison right. is pretty different than the actual truth because mm. they saw the Oliver Stone movie. Right. And it's just, I mean, it's just ridiculous. We're, we're not whitewashing him. We're not out to make him an angel, but we're not out to demonize him either, as so many have done. Uh, I've said that before. That's sort of a, uh, you know, retread quote, but it's true. And uh, we're just trying to get to the essence of, you know, a real human being. I mean, uh, not to say he didn't do bad things, not to say he didn't do good things, but, but who people, who was he really? You know, people yeah. think of him as this pretentious poetry spouting, <laughs> drunk druggy, basically, and. I don't. Uh, I mean, some of it's true, but some of it's not. You remember the show Dark Skies, right? I love Dark Skies. Do you remember when Jim Morrison? But there was Jim. Dark, uh-uh. Dark Skies, and he's all like, <laughs> he's all doing his Jim Morrison thing, and uh, walking with actor, a, a, an actor, a book, walking uh, with a book, and, and spouting, spouting poetry, yeah. and we're just like, <laughs> while while tremendously high, of course, you know, yeah. of course, and uh, he, and he didn't do that. Not to life. say that he might not have done that here and there once in a while, but there was far more to him than that. Yeah. So, wow. and we have a Do Facebook for that, and I don't. Was great. Oh yeah, yeah. I hear they to... might be reviving that. Uh, really, it's Bryce awesome Zabel show. was the creator of that. I have to uh, check it out. Very cool. Is show. it on Netflix? I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You should check though. It's really good. We have the DVDs. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. <laughs> thank you guys Jeff so much Jeff for having me. You guys are great, and thank you for doing what you do. You know, it takes a lot of courage to p- take an idea and it put does. it on a film. So, I mean, that's a lot of time. Especially when it's this far outside of the box. Mm. <laughs> well, we appreciate it because we love that stuff here on Truth Be Told. Thank and you. I'm uh, uh, Tony Sweet. And I'm I'm Eddie Connor. I'm, I'm, I'm Eddie Connor. Please go to <laughs> truthbetoldwebtv.com. You can check out this video on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Uh, leave a comment. Let us know what you think. And go to our also um, I, iTunes and iHeartRadio. Please listen to us on there. Go to our, web, uh, let's see, Twitter. What else? Twitter page. <laughs> I, on our Tony. There's too many things to remember. And I think you guys have a Twitter. Uh, we for, do. Yes. Uh, it's Strange Sept. <laughs> Sept. Oh, that's clever. Sept. I yeah. couldn't S-E-P-T. do the full thing. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's why yeah, I did on Tony it. because I couldn't do sweet. We yeah. just followed Stanton Friedman today. We're following you, Stanton. Oh, we're speaking. <laughs> we're coming after you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much. And uh, check us out every week right here on Universal Broadcasting Network at 4 o'clock. All right.
We're out of here. All right. Bye, Eddie. Bye.